Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today is the first of what I hope will be an ongoing series of interviews about the risks posed by nuclear weapons. The risk of nuclear war or terrorism is a very concrete problem that is really well understood on a technical level. The hard questions are what policies countries actually might be willing to adopt that would lower those risks. And for individuals, the difficult question is how they can possibly place themselves to influence decisions that are often made at the top of the military or the government. In future, I hope to have an episode that delves into how people thought about keeping the world safe through the invention of nuclear weapons in the 40s and 50s. There were a number of people who foresaw the invention of nuclear weapons and the resulting nuclear standoff between the US and Soviet Union uh, well before those things happened. And some of them made active efforts to influence US policy to ensure that the invention of nuclear weapons didn't lead to a disastrous outcome. I think there's potentially quite a lot that we can learn from those experiences about how we might be able to keep the world safe when we create uh, the future equivalents of nuclear weapons, whether that be artificial intelligence or some biotechnology or something else entirely. Just after we recorded this interview, the book The Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg came out, which uh, I'm listening to right now in the audiobook version, and it's a really cracking history of US nuclear policy and close calls with Armageddon. I can certainly recommend uh, checking it out, uh, though I don't agree with all of the solutions Ellsberg puts forward, and hopefully we can discuss some of those disagreements in future episodes. Finally, if you're looking for other podcasts to listen to, in addition to this one, can I suggest trying out Conversations with Tyler? Like this show, it's a series of long-form interviews with really smart people on topics that they know a lot about, hosted in that case by polymath economist Tyler Cohen. I particularly enjoyed the recent episode with Sujatha Gidla about the treatment of untouchables in modern-day India, among other things. And now I bring you Samantha pitts Today, I'm speaking with Samantha pitts Samantha joined the Nuclear Threat Initiative in 2012 and serves as Senior Director of the Global Nuclear Policy Program. At NTI, she's led two major projects, the Nuclear Security Index and the Global Dialogue on Nuclear Security Priorities. She focuses on cybersecurity, US-Russia relations, and nuclear weapons policy. Samantha completed an MPA degree at the Harvard Kennedy School, focused on foreign policy and national security, and is also a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Samantha. Hi, yeah, no, it's it's great to be here. And I, I think it's really great that you're doing this series of podcasts to really bring some awareness to some of the major threats, global threats that we're facing. And so I thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, so recently we've had uh, episodes about uh, risks from artificial intelligence and cybersecurity and pandemics. So it's it's good to finally get to uh, perhaps the oldest and most obvious uh, risk to the to the continuation of human civilization. I mean, North Korea's nuclear program has been all over the news lately. So it's, it's a pretty timely discussion. I, I just kind of hope that I will all still be alive to, to actually release the podcast in a couple of weeks. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's been an interesting time. That's an uh, understatement. So I think, I think we've only got, got an hour or two with you because you, you've got so much to do, but I'm sure this, this won't be the last interview. But first, tell us a bit about your work uh, at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. What, what do you actually do? So the Nuclear Threat Initiative is a, a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was founded in, in 2001 by former Senator Sam Nunn and Ted Turner of CNN. And what they wanted to do was figure out how a nonprofit organization could have an impact on reducing various threats, WMD threats, weapons of mass destruction. So the organizational mission is to reduce those threats. I've been working on a couple of those. The first is the threat of a terrorist acquiring some sort of weapon of mass destruction, such as a nuclear weapon or a dirty bomb. I worked on that for the first four years I was at NTI. And then the other type of threat is, of course, a state threat. So the threat of a country with a nuclear weapon potentially using that weapon. And that's what I focused on for the last year and a half or so. So I've done a mix of uh, looking at non-state actors, terrorist use of nuclear weapons, as well as the possibility of a country's use of nuclear weapons. I imagine most listeners, you know, believe that there are real risks from from nuclear weapons, but it's probably not something that they that they worry about uh, too much. Now, how did you decide that this was so important that you wanted to, you know, dedicate your career to it? So when I um, I went back to grad school after practicing law for a few years, I really wanted to go into public service, and and I was interested in national security and foreign policy. So when I went to grad school, I took some classes, and I t- I took a class where they had a a week long focus on nuclear terrorism, and we looked at 
the possibility of a, a terrorist group acquiring a nuclear weapon, you can imagine sort of a nuclear 9-11, right? So a, a major terrorist event like 9-11, but using some sort of nuclear device and how catastrophic that would be. So in the class, we looked at this problem and I had never heard about this threat before. And it was so shocking to me that this was a possibility that I, I became just very interested in in how to work on this issue. And I, I knew it was an issue where they need, I really need young, talented people, dedicated people working on this issue, both in government and outside of government. And so um, I, I really became interested in and looked into the possibility of a career and uh, and found NTI and ended up in NTI after I graduated. Tell me more about this dirty bomb scenario. Uh, should we be surprised that that hasn't happened already? Frankly, I am surprised. And the reason is, and I'll, I'll just give a little back Ground, really, there's two types of material that we should worry about. One is a nuclear material. So that's material that could be used in a nuclear device. So think uh, Hiroshima was a nuclear bomb. Uh, think about that kind of device being used by a, a terrorist. And that material is actually wide, you know, available. It's in 22 countries around the world have nuclear material. It's in hundreds of sites. Some of it's not secure. So you have that type of material, nuclear material that could be used in a nuclear bomb. You also have what are called radioactive sources. So these are things like cesium and cobalt, these sources that can be used for, um, let's say, you know, medical uses. So blood irradiators use the radiation to uh, irradiate the blood. So it's used in, for medical purposes. And there's other research purposes you would use radioactive sources. Those are in many, many more countries around the world, well over 100 countries and in thousands and thousands of sites, including in the U.S. and including in areas of the world where there's conflict um, and also active terrorist groups. And that material, if you think about a hospital for, for instance, you're, you know, you're not going to see a large security presence at a hospital where they have this equipment. Whereas if you if you go to a nuclear power plant, for instance, or a place where there's nuclear weapons, there'll be more of a heavy security presence. So you think about the fact that these radioactive materials are not only widely dispersed around the world, they're also in these facilities that have very little or no security. And the amount of material that you would get from a, a radioactive source is, I mean, I'm, I, I can't show you because we're not on video, but if you if take your little finger. That's the amount of, that's the material that you would get from that equipment. You could steal that, wrap some explosives around it, and then that explosion would spread radioactive material. And in some cases, that radioactive material would bond to concrete. So if you have, uh, let's say, downtown New York, Wall Street, or Capitol here in Washington, that radioactive material would bond to the, the walls. And, and you, you can't just you know decontaminate it or clean it. You have to rip down those structures. So imagine having to rip down several city blocks in downtown New York and the kind of economic impact that could have. But not only that, there's the sort of panic that you might get from people um, experiencing that kind of event. So that material, you know, widely available, not secured, potentially ha has a devastating economic and societal effect. Uh, it's it's really actually, frankly, hard, hard to see how that hasn't happened already. I think that is one of the high possibility threats we should be worried about. But the fact that a nuclear device might be not as probable as a a dirty bomb doesn't mean we shouldn't focus on that threat because obviously with a nuclear device you have uh, far greater consequences in terms of human life loss of life and injury so there's a lot of different scenarios that you might worry about you might worry about this dirty bomb case i guess you've got like small or medium scale nuclear exchanges the kind of thing you might get with north korea or between uh, india and pakistan and then you've got the the just all that nuclear exchange between china and america or america and russia and i suppose I, i'm not entirely sure which which one is you know, best to focus on in the past i thought it, it was Total, it's definitely the, the all-out nuclear exchange between uh, Russia and, and, and America, that, that kind of scenario, because just the consequences would, would be so much worse. But then what someone pointed out, it might be much more likely for someone to use this kind of dirty bomb. And even though it would only kill uh, a fairly limited number of people directly, you can imagine just the social consequences being quite catastrophic, that countries would become very unwilling to, to trade with one another uh, because they would worry that you know a bomb would be imported in, in, in a shipping container. Well, I think you have to focus on all these threats. There's no reason to focus on one and not the others, but you're absolutely right. We have the threat of you know, dirty bomb and these radioactive sources. You have the threat of nuclear material that's used in nuclear power, um, research reactors, also in, in military programs. You have those materials that could be stolen, but then you have this risk of some sort of nuclear exchange. I think you know, it's really important to understand that in the Cold War, we were dealing with basically two countries 
that had the ability to destroy one another. And so you had the concept of mutually assured destruction and relatively stable kind of environment because you had just that bilateral uh, dynamic. Now we have more countries with nuclear weapons. We have major potential flashpoints. We also, even though we're not in the the Cold War, we don't have maybe as high a potential of an all-out nuclear war between U.S. and Russia. You do have the possibility of some sort of miscalculation or an accident. And I'll talk actually a little bit about these different flashpoints and the, the possible risks. When it comes to North Korea, we know they have developed nuclear weapons. Uh, we're unsure of their ability to actually launch uh, a nuclear missile say, deep into the U.S. territories, but we know they have uh, developed uh, capabilities and those capabilities are increasing. But what you have is you have two leaders who are playing a game of verbal chicken over their nuclear programs. You have dangerous rhetoric. You have escalating threats. At some point, one of the sides is going to have to stop this escalation. And talk of an, some sort of military action against North Korea, I think is extremely dangerous um, in terms of the North Korean leader perceiving a threat that might have to be preempted in terms of the, a U.S. potential military attack on North Korea to, to prevent their program from progressing that could lead then to some sort of retaliation. Really what you ha- have there is a ticking time bomb and has to be walked back. There has to be an adult in the room to walk that back and not lead us into some accidental crisis that precipitates a nuclear exchange. So that's North Korea. Then you have India and Pakistan who have you know, decades long conflict flashpoints along the border. You have potential for a terrorist group to do another terrorist attack in India, to which India might feel the, ne- the necessity to respond militarily to Pakistan. And then you have a potential conventional war turning nuclear if Pakistan believes it is uh, facing an existential threat. It can use its nuclear weapons. So you have just th- there in that region, the potential for uh, escalation of a conventional war to a nuclear war. And then when it comes to U.S. and Russia, you have, you know, right now a really tense uh, situation. You have limited dialogue. You have limited military to military contacts. You have potential for accidents in the air. We're, we're, we're engaging in different regions in close quarters, and there's a potential if there's a some sort of accident for that to escalate. Especially when you know we have the tension between the two countries. And maybe the greatest risk is the scenario of some sort of false warning, where you have a U.S. early warning systems detecting an incoming attack from Russia, and then in a crisis where there's tension and lack of dialogue, the potential for the U.S. to believe it's under threat and then and respond with the nuclear force. And actually, there's been several cases in history in the last t- couple of decades where there were these false warnings because of different computer bugs or human error, where luckily there, there did not result in a nuclear exchange because someone was able to figure out that it was a false warning. But that's still a potential issue, especially when you bring into the mix the cyber vulnerabilities of some of the systems, some of the nuclear weapon systems, the, the communication systems, again, the satellites and radar, the early warning systems. If you think about some sort of group or another country spoofing an attack uh, and that would cause a response, that's a really real uh, a real threat. And the fact is that the U.S. and Russia have you know over a thousand nuclear weapons together that are, are, are just ready to launch within minutes. And if the U.S. were to believe it, it was under attack from Russian nuclear weapons, there would only be 10 or so minutes for a U.S. president to make a decision to respond before being hit. And so you have this intense time pressure on a U.S. leader to respond with a nuclear uh, strike. So you combine all those pieces together, the crisis, the tension, the lack of dialogue, the lack of cooperation, the increased rhetoric with the potential for a false warning and the cyber threat. And and you just, I don't have to tell the listeners, but that just hopefully sounds to them like a very scary scenario that we should be trying to avoid and, and walk back. That all sounds pretty terrifying. <laughs> um, earlier, you said you, you know uh, NTI wants to wants to focus on all of these problems. But are there any risks that you know worry you the most? Uh, you know that they really stand out as perhaps the most likely way that a, that a nuclear war could start within the next twenty years. I, I do think that we we think the issue of the the nuclear weapons ready to launch on a quick basis. And uh, the potential cyber element to that, as well as the U.S.-Russia tensions, that really is maybe the, the the most likely use of a nuclear weapon we might see. We're also, again, worried about 
terrorism. And terrorists have in the past stated their interest in acquiring a nuclear weapon, whether it be stealing the material and making it themselves. And we have to remember that terrorist groups are well financed. They have potential access to technology and scientific capabilities of building a nuclear weapon. So that is that is a threat that we have to worry about, too. We can't become complacent because the news is all about North Korea or Russia. We still have to worry about the terrorist threat. Has NTI ever tried to estimate, you know, the annual probability of any of these thing, things, these things happening, or is that just viewed as as not not practical? Yeah, I mean, we we certainly haven't. But um, you know, part of the issue is there has never been a nuclear terrorist attack. So some would say, well, the history shows that it's unlikely. Well, you can't predict the future from from history, and because the consequences of a nuclear device being detonated are so grave, so catastrophic, would be you know, society changing. We cannot be complacent about that threat. And we have to continuously work to ensure that all nuclear materials, nuclear weapons are locked down to the greatest extent or reduced and and eliminated where possible. If a a nuclear device were to go off the next day, people would be wondering, why did, what, what could we have done to prevent that act? And the answer of, well, we didn't think it was likely, so we didn't focus our attention on it. It's not going to fly with the public if if that happens. Just given how grave the consequences are. Oh, absolutely. I mean, again, imagine imagine 9-11 using a nuclear device. Instead of a few thousand deaths, imagine hundreds of thousands. So I, I spoke to a researcher at Oxford in, in another interview uh, who had tried to estimate the likelihood of a nuclear war each each year uh, and, and concluded that it was somewhere between one in a hundred and one in a thousand each year, which which sounds uh, fairly low. But then if you add that up over a century, <laughs> the chances the chances of a person dying in it becomes quite quite significant. So I'll, I'll put up a link to, to that episode and, and and the paper where they tried to do that that calculation and listeners can take a look. Tell me a bit more about the about the cybersecurity issues because that's something that you're particularly knowledgeable about, right? Right. So NTI in the past. Few years have, has become more concerned about cyber threats to not only civilian nuclear facilities, so power plants or research reactors, places where there's a, a nu- nuclear um, material, but also to uh, cyber threats to nuclear weapons and command and control. So we're working on both of those issues. On the civilian side, the worry is that a cyber attack could be used to disable security systems, allowing some you know terrorist or, or somebody to to enter a facility, enter a secure area and steal material, sell it on the black market maybe, it gets into the hands of a terrorist group and then they, they can use it to build a nuclear device. So the using of the cyber to facilitate some sort of physical breach of a, of a nuclear facility. You can also think about, for instance, think about Fukushima, right? So in Fukushima, you had the cutting of the generator and the, the electricity and so that there was no cooling and so you led to catastrophic radioactive release. Think about something like that happening because of a cyber attack where a group cuts off the electric supply to the facility and then leading to a radioactive release. So you have the terrorist element of using cyber, perhaps in combination with a physical attack to either sabotage a facility, cause radiation to release, or to steal material for a nuclear device. When you think about the nuclear weapon side and the potential cyber threats there, one of the um, things that yeah, we we worry about, I already mentioned a little bit, is again, the use of a cyber attack to somehow disrupt or disable or, or modify early warning systems. Again, the example is a spoofed attack. So the your early warning systems show a nuclear an incoming nuclear attack, which isn't the case. And because of the time pressure, the accidental or miscalculated response that you would have. And then w- once you consider potential cyber vulnerabilities and communication system. What, what happens if there's a crisis and the leadership can't communicate with uh, the military or those who are in charge of nuclear weapons? If you can't assure that you can use your nuclear weapons when desired or that you can't assure the unauthorized use of nuclear weapons, what does that do in terms of stability with other countries? If there's a belief that we might not have confidence in our ability to either use or prevent the use of our nuclear weapons, how does that undo all the the decades long assumption about how you maintain stability globally and, and nuclear deterrence? And so, you know, we think that countries, governments, especially you know, U.S. and Russia, really need to 
to think about how cyber security and cyber threats impact just even the role of nuclear weapons and whether uh, we can have a continued confidence in them. How good is the cybersecurity for China and Russia and, and the US and, and their nuclear weapons? Is, is this something that they've invested heavily in? Well, you know, it's hard to tell because so much is classified, but we believe that there's a need to do more. Is there the possibility of anyone, uh, you, you know, breaching the cybersecurity of these weapons and then actually being able to launch them? Or, or, or is that at least that protected against? So the experts that we've talked to believe that it's unlikely, but it's not a zero possibility. And you have to think about the fact that we're in a in a situation where terrorist groups get more sophisticated. Technology is changing so quickly that keeping up with potential threats is extremely difficult and perhaps impossible. And as countries are modernizing their nuclear weapon systems, whether it's, you have to remember, it's not just the nuclear weapon, but all the systems that are linked to that, the communications, you know, how the launch codes are transmitted. There's all these different systems. As as systems are modernized, increasing digitization of them would potentially lead to more vulnerabilities. So it may be that currently it would be difficult for a, a terrorist group, a non-state actor to take control of a nuclear weapon and launch it through a cyber attack. It's not impossible and we can't rule out the possibility that that threat could actually increase as technology and capabilities evolve. So bad cybersecurity is one of the you know potential factors that, that could make, make the risk of nuclear weapons greater. Are there any others that we should be particularly focused on, just like bad general relationships between America and China or, or bad equipment and training among, among the staff uh, working in the facilities? So when it comes to relationships between countries, I mean, I think the key is the, the necessity of, of having dialogue and cooperation. It doesn't help to walk away from those that we would see as adversaries. So I just take U.S. and Russia, for example. In the Cold War, the two countries were adversaries, no doubt about it. But they continue to talk. They put in place arms control agreements. They regulated their relationship and their weapons. Now we're in a situation where we are not in a Cold War, but dialogue is almost uh, nil between the U.S. and Russia on these on these major issues. And yes, we do have differences between the US and Russia on Ukraine, Syria. I mean, there's a long list of, of issues we have differences on, but those shouldn't mean that we we stop cooperating on these really existential threats that we both face. The US and Russia have over 90% of the world's nuclear materials, nuclear weapons. There's a special responsibility that they do what is necessary to reduce not only terrorist threats, nuclear, radiological terrorist threats, but also the the risks of, of a nuclear war, nuclear exchange. When you don't have that dialogue, you're not working on these on these threats and you're not taking action to reduce risks and instead actually going in the wrong direction at escalating threats, that that is extremely dangerous. So so yes, uh, having poor relations and a, a lack of dialogue between countries with nuclear weapons is extremely dangerous. We need to get back to a place where setting aside our differences we're able to work on these these common threats. Do you know what the the strategy is on, on each for each party there for for not uh, talking to one another about this? Because it seems you know even even though the US and Russia might disagree about Ukraine, neither of them wants to be annihilated in a, in a nuclear war. So you think they they would keep the communication channels open about this kind of thing? You know, I can't speak for the governments, but yeah, I mean, I think nobody wants to have a nuclear exchange. Nobody wants that. But I think that, you know, in the U.S., for instance, there's a lot of politics around Russia. We have uh, the issue with Russian interference in the elections. We have issues with Ukraine. We have issues with Syria. And the political atmosphere right now is so charged that it makes it very difficult, even among people who believe there should be cooperation, makes it extremely difficult to actually take any steps. And, you know, I believe that politics should, should be set aside when we're thinking about these catastrophic threats. But the reality is politics is politics. So we need to get back to a place where we can we can actually start working together again. If there were a nuclear war, do we have a sense of what fraction of the world's population would die? Because I know there's been a lot of controversy about how bad the, the nuclear winter effect would be. And scientists seem to have gone back and forth over, over the, the last few decades. Yeah, I mean, there's different, when you think about the different types of nuclear use, you have anything from a small 
a small nuclear device used by a terrorist group that could kill, you know, maybe in the hundred, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, depending where it is, all the way to a massive U.S.-Russia exchange where you potentially have millions. And then you have, um, you know, something in between. And I think the case of the nuclear winter research is really a good example of of how, you know, no matter where you are in the world, you, we have to worry about these issues. So take India and Pakistan. So some might think, well, even if they have a small, limited nuclear exchange, they're over there and, you know, it will affect them. But we're, we over here, we don't have to worry about it as much. But the fact is, the the research has, recent research has shown that if India and Pakistan were to have a nuclear exchange, and the, I think this the modeling, they used 50 nuclear weapons each, um, and each nuclear weapon about the size of the, the bomb used in Hiroshima, just that the use of, of, of that limited use would have a massive effect on, on the climate. You would have the smoke that blocks out the sun, causes global cooling, and then that leads to crops dying and the, the, uh, food production, and again, this global famine that could last decades. So, you know, you think of this limited war between India and Pakistan, actually, that would have catastrophic global effects. More people could die indirectly than than are killed directly, basically. Oh, exactly, exactly. So, so again, th- this is not something where we can say, "Oh, well, w- this is not our problem. Let's not worry about it. This is a problem for someone else." That's not the case. I mean, it's, it's the same with um, nuclear terrorism. You could have a country with that doesn't have any nuclear material or any nuclear facilities. Say, "Well, I don't have any material. I don't have any facilities, so I don't have to worry about terrorists. I don't have to worry about nuclear terrorism. That's somebody else's problem." No, that's not the case. If there's a nuclear device used anywhere in the world, that affects everyone. Not not only, you know, the physical effects, potentially, depending on where you are, but economic effects, societal effects. We're all affected if there is some nuclear device used, whether it's a small terrorist device or a state nuclear weapon. I'll try to find uh, some recent research papers on the, on the nuclear winter effect. I'm obviously not a climate scientist, but uh, my understanding is that the main controversy has been about how high the particulates would go after the nuclear weapons were used. Because if they go high enough, then they tend to stay in the atmosphere, blocking out the sun for many, many years. But if they don't get uh, so high, then they tend to get rained out of the atmosphere and it would only last months or years. So th- I think that's something that scientists, I mean, it's just extremely hard to extremely hard to model because we fortunately don't have any experience of uh, a nuclear war to, to calibrate the, the climate models. Yeah, and there, there's lots of different uh, websites that do modeling of, you know, attacks. So you can type in where you live and the type of device, and it will show you where the types of injuries or deaths would occur. So if you want to really scare yourself, you can type in where you live. For instance, if you if you were to put in downtown Washington, D.C. in one of these models, you know, I work about a block away from the White House and all of the, the rings where you have 100% uh, fatalities. Well, I'm sitting in one of those rings, so it's it's really not pretty to think about. But if you want to scare yourself, I, I highly recommend going to those websites. I suppose if you ever need motivation to keep on working, you can just go and go and check out that website. <laughs> So we've, we've talked a bit about the, the nature of the threat. Uh, let's let's talk a bit about what is actually uh, being being done to deal with it. Can, who in the US and, and other governments is responsible for, for minimizing the risk of nuclear weapons being used? Are, are, are there people who clearly know that this is their job? So the responsibility really differs based on the country. You know, in the US, it's the military that controls the actual use of a nuclear weapon. The Department of Energy runs the nuclear weapons complex that actually the NNSA, which is part of the Department of Energy, runs the maintenance and you know, security, etc. of nuclear weapons. And then you also have the regulator that regulates the use of nuclear materials and technology and how we interact with other countries on nuclear issues, that uh, licenses, etc. And put in place the standards, the security and safety standard. In other countries, it'll be a slightly different arrangement. But one thing that's really important is to ensure that you do have a strong regulator that's independent, putting in place you know the best standards and regulations possible on both security and safety, but also providing oversight on facilities. And really, the level of independence varies across countries, and also the level of resources varies across countries. But, you know, no matter how small or large your program, like I said, terrorists can find material in all these different places and they're going to go where it's least secure. So every country with those materials and facilities uh, needs to make sure that they're doing, you know, what is necessary to secure them. And so, again, regulations, regulators, also private entities. So in a lot of countries, nuclear, civilian nuclear facilities like power plants, they are run by private companies. And so ensuring that these companies from the top management, the CEO, 
the board of directors, all the way down to the person who's you know next to the, the secure areas or in the secure areas or responsible for security, that there's a strong culture of security in those organizations, that there's no complacency. And we've seen actually some examples of pretty bad security culture, including in the U.S. A few years ago, one of the facilities in the, in the U.S. that had highly enriched uranium, you know, really dangerous nuclear materials in a facility that was supposedly the Fort Knox of, of nuclear facilities. It's called Y-12. There was a, a situation where a, a nun, a peace activist, an 80-plus-year-old 80, 80 nun broke into this the facility, broke through several layers of fences, and they painted blood on, on the walls. And uh, the security guards ignored it for quite a bit of time. And I, I recommend that you put some material on this on your website because it's quite alarming to think about in the U.S., in a, a military government facility, that you would have such a lapse of security culture and uh, such complacency that you would have a, a break-in of a facility. So, I mean, that just goes to show that the issue of security is something that all countries have to worry about and making sure that there's strong standards and also strong culture in you know this recognition that the responsibility of securing material is in place throughout an organization. It must be extraordinarily difficult for the organizations that are handling nuclear weapons to, to maintain a really strong security culture because basically we want them to do hopefully nothing for hundreds of years, never use these weapons, but to remain absolutely vigilant every every minute of the day for those for those centuries where they're not hopefully not using the, the weapons at all. It seems almost inevitable that the staff would become complacent because just, you know, nothing is going on because 99.999% of the time that there are no threats. Well, I think that, you know, you've hit a point, a good point, because you're right. The purpose of our nuclear weapons is to prevent their use. You know, that's that's the, the theory, at least, that having nuclear weapons is our insurance that we, we won't have to use them. And so, yes, the, the people who are responsible for actually implementing their use, um, maintaining them, et cetera, there has been a loss of morale that we've seen some incidents where, for instance, guards were, uh, you know, left the door open or... Uh, we're sleeping on the job or cheating on tests. So th- there's actually some examples in recent years of this sort of loss of morale and among the, those who are charged with, you know, using and keeping these nuclear weapons. If somehow you just uh, got a lot of influence over the U.S. government and you could tell them to do three things that would be really useful for re- reducing the risk, uh, what, what three things would those be? Well, I would put on top of the list taking these nuclear weapons off of their quick launch status. So as I said previously, they are ready to be used within minutes and the time pressure that creates creates some dangers uh, in terms of escalation, miscalculation. So increasing the time that a decision maker would have to use a nuclear weapon, taking these missiles off of prompt launch, I think would be top of the list because again, you, you, you reduce the risk of some sort of accident or miscalculation. Second, I would say get back into a dialogue with Russia. Um, we are reaching a point where we have a, a treaty that we have with Russia that limits the number of nuclear weapons that both of us can have. We're reaching a point where that treaty is set to expire in a few years, and there's currently no discussions or dialogue about what to do next. And if that treaty expires without any replacement or extension, we're getting into a situation where we, where we haven't been for decades, where we have this unregulated environment where you could potentially have a new arms race. So I would tell the government, you need to get back on track with arms control and dialogue, setting aside these you know, the, the tensions that we have, deal with the tensions we have with Russia on a separate track, but get back to dialogue on, on risk reduction. We don't need to get into another arms race. And then third, I would I would say the U.S. has commitment under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to eventually work towards getting rid of nuclear weapons. And previous governments have, have moved towards that by decreasing the role of nuclear weapons in, in our security, reducing numbers, taking them off high alert in a trajectory that includes steps that reduce risks. Now we're in a situation where we have a U.S. government with plans to refurbish and modernize and potentially have new nuclear weapons and also the rhetoric around nuclear weapons and activities that that seem to step away from where we want to be going. We need to take steps towards a world without nuclear weapons. We need to take steps 
towards that, even recognizing that that's not an easy task and it will take a long time to get there. But we need to be looking at all that we're doing in our nuclear policies through the lens of are we reducing risks and you know moving towards that vision of a world without nuclear weapons? Or are we doing something that actually potentially increases risks and moves us away from that vision? And we have to remember that everything we do when it comes to nuclear policy, you know, other countries are looking at what we're doing. So if you have a you know countries without nuclear weapons seeing the U.S. increasing the role of nuclear weapons, creating new nuclear weapons, that sends the wrong message to other countries who we're telling that they should not get nuclear weapons. So we really have to you know think about how what we're doing not only affects the risks that we face, but also the message it sends in terms of our international object- objectives for preventing the spread and use of nuclear weapons. The campaign for, for full-on nuclear disarmament has, has a bit of momentum behind it at the moment. What do you, what do you think of that? I, I, I certainly worry that too much disarmament could make the a relationship between nuclear powers uh, kind of too unstable because uh, you wouldn't have this mutually assured destruction uh, effect anymore. Well, I think that it's hard to prove a negative. I, I won't get into you know, who's right on whether having nuclear weapons has prevented major conflict. I think that it's that's really hard to get evidence for. But we do know that nuclear weapons create risks. And today we're in a completely different environment than we were decades ago. Again, now we have nine countries with nuclear weapons. Now we have non-state actors interested in nuclear weapons. Now we have cyber threats that could potentially undermine confidence in nuclear weapons. So I wouldn't call that a stable environment where we can sort of be confident that there's not going to be a use of a nuclear weapon. I don't think that's true. That said, you know, while we should emphasize that a world without nuclear weapons is where we need to go, I don't think that we can be naive that it's going to happen overnight. So if you look at the recent movement towards banning nuclear weapons, it's a a political statement that countries are saying, this is what we believe. This is the vision that we should uh, move towards. Nuclear weapons you know, are immoral and should not be used, but that alone is not going to get us where we need. There has to be a path, and there has to be a path that includes steps to get there. So we, we can't wish away nuclear weapons overnight as much as many of us uh, would want to. We have to put in place conditions. One of the things that NTI has been working on is a process uh, that's uh, we, we work on with the U.S. government, but many other countries are involved, thinking about what technology and what tools are needed eventually, if when we get to a place where we can completely you know, reduce and dismantle nuclear weapons and lead to disarmament, what are the tools we actually need to verify that countries are doing that? Because once we get to that point, we can't just sort of trust that countries are doing that. We need trust and verify. So we need the tools to be able to verify that so that there's confidence that all countries would be living up to those disarmament obligations. That's you know, hard, tough work. And there's lots of work that needs to be done to get to a place where we could have disarmament. And so, yes, it's really good to have the vision and the commitment and countries stating that they believe that that's the goal. But we also have to do the hard work necessary to get there. So when, when we've looked at uh, how much influence someone might hope to have uh, over, over nuclear security issues, it looked to us like inside of governments, there are quite a lot of people who think, who think about these issues. And so it could potentially be, be quite crowded, uh, quite, quite a crowded area. It could, could be hard for you know, one person to, to really make a big difference. But outside of government, there's really not many, not many groups at all uh, working, on, working on this issue. I guess there's, so, there's, so there's NTI, but I can't think of almost any other nonprofits that, that, are, that are focused on nuclear security issues um, and certainly not for profits profits either. Is, is that correct? I, I think there's a, a lot of organizations that are working on this issue. In Washington, several organizations focus on this. We have organizations around the world focus on this, academics. If you think about the, the nuclear ban treaty that was recently approved in the, the UN process, uh, the driving force behind that was a consortium of nonprofits. Uh, ICANN, uh, which which was recently awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for its efforts, was you know an example of uh, non governmental groups pushing and leading to governments actually taking action. And I think that despite you know what you think about the ban treaty itself, and there's differing opinions, I think you have to give credit to uh, ICANN and, and and the group and the, the organizations that were part of that effort for for really getting getting something done and getting it on the agenda. And I think uh, that shows the, the impact that non-government groups can have. 
So if, if you had a, a talented young person who wanted to uh, work on, on nuclear policy, do you think that'd make a bigger difference, you know, trying to join the military or, you know, civilian agencies that regulate the military or working outside the government, you know, perhaps at uh, NTI or, or, or ICANN or, or something like that? I think there's there's different ways to have impact. And I, I wouldn't really say one is better than the other or more likely to lead to change. I think, you know, the, the way government works is different from outside the government. There's bureaucracy, et cetera. But I think you can have a sense of purpose working inside government on issues. You have to remember that even if we have a you know, government where potentially we believe that maybe they're going in the wrong direction when it comes to the role of nuclear weapons, you have to remember that inside the government, you have people who who work there, regardless of who is the president and who is in power, who are tackling uh, risks, risk re- reduction issues every single day. They're working on helping to secure materials around the world. They're working on programs to reduce materials around the world. They're working on threat reduction issues in a, in a tangible way. And, and I think that the people who I know who've who worked on those issues believe they've made an impact. And, uh, and I, I also believe that they have too. If you think about the people in government who negotiate arms control treaties, the, the people who negotiated the Iran deal, these are you know real achievements that make the world safer every day. And so you can have an impact in government. On the outside, I believe that you know we can have an impact too. If you're outside government, you have you know, you're not dealing with the sort of everyday exigencies of, of, of governing. There's time and, and space to really think creatively, come up with new ideas, and then also, you know, to push from the outside for more ambitious action by governments. So it's really two different ways of having an impact, but I think both are really fulfilling and have a high sense of purpose. So what are NTI's uh, priorities uh, at, at the moment? So we're working on, you know, several priorities, and I think I've mentioned a few of them already. You know, one is the dirty bomb threat, and part of that is, you know, I mentioned that there's these radioactive sources in different devices and hospitals and research centers, et cetera. And in these blood irradiators in, used in hospitals, you can actually replace that equipment with equipment that doesn't have the dangerous material in it. And actually, it's it's not expensive, it's not difficult, and so there really needs to be a, a push for hospitals to replace that equipment equipment so that the material won't be stolen. So we're working on some initiatives on that. I think that's definitely an area that's ripe for some potential congressional action on, um, you know, making sure that we're using equipment that can't be used for terrorist purpose. We also have a new program on biosecurity. And you you had spoken to a colleague of mine, a previous episode, we'll go into depth on this. But if you think about potential existential threats, think about pandemics and, and the potential use of some sort of bio threat or you know disease or that is spread um, intentionally by terrorist groups. So there's a existential threat there that needs to be addressed. And now NTI is is really working to increase work in that area. We also, of course, are looking at nuclear security and the nuclear terrorist threat, and then and then finally also the nuclear weapons threat. So again, looking at cyber vulnerabilities and nuclear weapons, a f- big focus on U.S. Russia and what can be done to get them back on track to dialogue and also general nuclear weapon risk reduction. So thinking about how we can bring countries back to that common vision of a world without nuclear weapons and take some steps, some common steps that would get us back on track to, to lead there. I mean, with the U.S.-Russia tensions, North Korea, there's there's a whole lot of problems that sort of get us off track and we need to get back on track working together in the international community having the U.S. and Russia work together to move us towards a a safer, more secure world. And again, back to that pathway towards a world without nuclear weapons. With, you know, members of Congress and, and people in the White House facing, you know, so many pressing political issues every day, uh, is, it, is it practical to get uh, them to pay much attention to, to nuclear security issues uh, when that's, you know, probably not something that, they, that their constituents are um, mostly worried about? Well, and this is exactly the problem. So there are many members of Congress who believe that uh, nuclear security and uh, reducing nuclear risks is of vital importance. Many, many, you know, many of them have nuclear facilities in their districts, so they they're keenly aware of, of the risks. But you 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 hit the nail on the head. These many of these offices have small staffs. They have limited resources, and then of course you're you're using your your time, you know, your p- political time on issues that your constituents are worried about. 
about. So um, I, I've heard from one congressman that nuclear issues, nuclear security, they, they're not even on the top 10 list. People are worried about jobs. They're worried about health care. They're worried about educating their kids. They're worried about all the, the issues that affect their day to day life. Something like the possibility of a nuclear device, a nuclear terrorist event, or even a, you know, a nuclear exchange with North Korea or Russia. Those are not on people's minds um, on their daily basis or perhaps even ever. And so when that uh, when your constituents are not asking you to take action on those issues, it's really hard to devote resources and time to those issues. So there really needs to be you know more done to raise awareness and interest on, on these risks among the public. The public needs to demand that their governments are, are being responsible actors when it comes to addressing these risks. They need to demand that their governments are doing as much as possible to prevent a terrorist from stealing nuclear material, whether it's here or somewhere else in the world. They need to demand that the government is is not expending resources on bolstering its nuclear weapons capability and potentially increasing risks. So there needs to be a, a public education and, and, and awareness about these risks and what the governments are doing about them and a call for, for action from leaders. I think one of the reasons that we suspect that there are some pretty good opportunities here is that it's a pretty neglected issue. It's it's hard to get uh, politicians or I imagine even the military to, to really set their minds to this issue in a consistent way because there's just uh, too many other things in the news every day that they have to that they have to worry about. So when it comes to modernization of of America's uh, nuclear weapons, isn't it possible that that could make things safer because you'd have you know better security protocols or at least you know there wouldn't be there wouldn't be very old old nuclear weapons lying around that that could break or, or you know have accidents. Well, I think there's you know multiple issues. One is, of course, the weapons that we do have must be safe and secure and, and reliable. And that means maintaining them and refurbishing them as necessary. But there's a difference between that and expending massive resources on uh, weapons that we don't need or should be thinking about phasing out. So we shouldn't be designing new weapon systems and putting billions of dollars into those systems when we don't need them. I mean, think about how many nuclear weapons we have, j- just the ones that are you know active and deployed s- somewhere, you know, around 1800 and then many, many more in reserve and and storage. Do we really need that many? (laughs) And so when you think about refurbishing and maintaining and and building, you know, replacement weapons or new weapons, you have to, you have to wonder why are we doing that when we could be reducing? And I'll I'll just say that in um, the Obama administration, at least that the Pentagon made a determination that we could in fact reduce our, our deployed arsenal by a third. And even if it's done on a unilateral basis, and still be able to respond to threats around the world, including against our allies. So we need to be thinking about instead of spending you know billions of dollars on something shiny and new or even maintaining something that we already have whether in fact we should just be reducing those numbers there, you know perfect example is there's different types of nuclear weapons and different deployments some are at sea some are uh, you know ready to be launched from planes and then others are, are in ground-based silos you know out in the you know cornfields <laughs> and you know a lot of people think that we don't need as many as we have but also that some of those the, the ground-based ones should be you know eliminated because they pose a risk and so instead of investing in wholesale new set of those types of weapons, you know, maybe we should be thinking a little bit more carefully about whether that's an investment that we should be making because it, it locks it in for decades. Other than getting the US and Russia talking again, are there any other reforms that NTI would really like to see at the at the international level? So on the international level, just going back to the nuclear terrorism issue, you know, I talked about the importance of having high standards of security um, and reducing and eliminating those materials. I think one thing that would be quite shocking to people listening is to know that despite the danger of those nuclear materials, there's actually no international rules that regulate them. So if you think about things like aviation. There's international bodies that regulate aviation safety and security. And all the you know airlines that want to be flying into other countries need to abide by those rules. And there's transparency about the security and whether there's breaches, etc. When it comes to nuclear, you have these materials that can be used to cause hundreds of thousands of deaths. There's no rules of the road. Countries are able to do you know what they want to do. And in fact, 
have, have no uh, requirement to be transparent about what they're doing, even though the loss of, you know, theft of a nuclear material in one country could impact another country. And so, so there really needs to be uh, a push to get to some sort of global system where all countries are following the same set of high standards and rules for securing material and sharing with one another that they're in fact doing that um, and, and constantly improving uh, their security. I'd also note that in, in when it comes to nuclear material security, 85% of nuclear material around the world actually is completely unmanaged or unregulated and not subject to any international standards or oversight. And that is the material that's in military and government programs. So the, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which some people, IEA, some people might have heard of, you know, looks at preventing nuclear material from moving from a peaceful use, a civilian use, for instance, in nuclear power to military use. And those who are familiar with the Iran deal know the IE has this role of, of making sure that material is not used for military purposes. They have some role on civilian nuclear material security in terms of helping countries you know, increase their capacity, training, etc. They have some guide, uh, guidelines and guidance. And none of that applies to this other military material, which is 85%. So that's globally not a great situation to be in with all this unregulated material and then the possible threat of a nuclear terrorist act. When it comes to the risks of a nuclear exchange and nuclear war, you know, as I said before, there needs to be a way to get back to a common vision, countries with nuclear weapons or without nuclear weapons, working together, moving towards a common set of steps and, and actions to decrease risks and move towards a world without nuclear weapons. Is there anything that you would particularly suggest that people could read or watch if they wanted to inform themselves a lot more about the issue of nuclear security and, and how it can be improved at either the domestic or international level? So I would highly recommend going into the NTI website, www.nti.org. And there's a, a lot of materials targeted at different audiences, some more suited to experts, but many others suited to you know regular people who just really want to learn more about the issue. Some tutorials about the nuclear terrorist threat, helping to understand nuclear weapons, weapons issues. There's material that's easy to understand on the modernization program. So you mentioned that previously, you know, the, the money and resources being expended to modernize and refurbish nuclear weapons. There's a lot of material that's really easy to understand. I also mentioned the issue of prompt launch and having nuclear weapons ready to launch on a moment's notice. There's some really great materials on our website that really help you understand these timelines and the types of decision making that is involved in these processes. So lots of really good information. And then other NGOs have also really good information. Union of Concerned Scientists has some great infographics about the issue of prompt launch. And there's many others. I would also recommend, you know, I always like to recommend watching Dr. Strangelove. I mean, it's a it's a great movie. It's a funny movie, but also it's, it's not too far from the risks we face today. And so I, I highly recommend that movie. Yeah, that's one of my favorite movies of all time. If, if you haven't seen it, you should go watch it tonight. Uh, I might also just suggest Command and Control by Eric Schlosser. Uh, Schlosser is a book that I read recently, which uh, covers a lot of the history of uh, nuclear weapons during during the Cold War and both the engineering side and the, and the, and the policy side. Uh, and I found it, it, was, it was quite a page turner. That's a great suggestion. And, and in addition to the book, there's a film that was recently released, I believe, on um, PBS. And it's a, a documentary film that takes you th through you know these near misses potential nuclear catastrophe. And I, I highly recommend watching that film. So I'll, I'll chase up some of the links that you suggested there. And I also know another site that has a has a, a great list of all of the nuclear near misses uh, during the Cold War uh, and up to the present day, which is which is deeply disturbing. So <laughs> listeners, if, if they're not, not convinced already, they can go go check those, uh, chase those links out. Let's move on to some more kind of concrete suggestions of what listeners could do if they're thinking that maybe this is something that they'd like to, to dedicate their, their career to. If you're interested in working on, on nuclear security in the, in the way that you've done. Uh, what kind of things might people study uh, early on? So I think it, is, it depends on sort of where your interests lie. So there's really two avenues. One is the more technical side. So physics or chemistry, engineering, e even these days with the cyber issue, the you know, computer con computer studies or cybersecurity studies. The other avenue is more the policy avenue uh, where you would study international relations or perhaps become um, an expert in a certain region. So maybe you know, the Middle East is a, is a region of where nuclear power is potentially expanding or maybe you're a North Korea expert or China expert. So there's multiple ways to get in just depending on, on your 
you know, your affinities. And I happened to get in through, I mean, I went through the policy track because I'm not a technical person. I'm not a scientist. I went through the policy track and I went uh, more into the sort of topical area of, of nuclear versus regional or sort of a language perspective just based on my background. But there's really no one way to do it. And I think that if, if you're interested in the issue, go down the track that you're inclined to go down and then see how the nuclear issues intersect with what you're studying and that they intersect with many, many issues. And I guess people should kind of decide whether to do the policy side or the technical side based on which one's the the best personal fit for their interests and their skills. Exactly. I mean, I, I would I wouldn't go and do a chemistry PhD because that would be bad. I can tell you that. <laughs> I I'm I'm definitely more on the policy side. But um, you know, there's ways to combine these. You could people who are majoring in sciences and their undergraduate could then certainly go and do a policy degree as a master's degree or combine it in some sort of PhD. And the people who who know policy and the technical side of things are actually unique and 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 provide a really good perspective. And so if you are technically inclined, that might be a way to, to, to do both parts of it. But certainly you should not be deterred that you're not, you know, a whiz on chemistry and physics and sciences as, as I am exhibit A for that. Should most people who want to go into this area pretty seriously do some kind of postgraduate study, either, either a master's or a PhD? I mean, I don't think it's, it's necessary. Many of the people who work on, on these issues outside of government happen to have graduate degrees. It's not across the board, but they do. And it certainly enables you to go into depth into an issue. There's there's also various programs that uh, are designed for graduate students where you would graduate from your graduate program and then go into some sort of fellowship in the government. For instance, there's one at the NNSA, it's a graduate fellowship program for people who are coming out of grad school and that gives them experience in the Department of Energy's nuclear complex working on these issues directly. And uh, I know many people who've done that and believe it to be a really valuable experience. Again, these fellowships get you sort of a foot in the government and get to experience what it's like to work in the government. And then many people continue in government or they come out and work at an NGO. But um, certainly so- some programs are designed for graduate students. That's fantastic. Are, are there any other graduate programs that you'd like to single out as you know being common or particularly uh, you know successful pathways for people? One of the the major programs is the Presidential Management Fellowship Program, and that that allows people to you know work in different departments and agencies, not just nuclear or even national security, but throughout the government. And those are really valuable programs to again you know get experience in government to to learn and and figure out what type of work you would want to do in government. And I know many people who who started those programs years ago and they're, they're still working government now, seven, eight years later, eight, year, 10 years later. Um, many of my colleagues did those programs when they finished grad school. So, I, you know, I highly recommend looking into those programs if you're interested in government work. Is this really something that people can only get into if they can get a, a US security clearance or, or perhaps a UK security clearance? Uh, well, I mean, I've been working in this area for five and a half years and I don't have a security clearance. I haven't worked for the government. And I know many people who, you know, they're from different countries or they've never worked in the government and they don't have a security clearance. It's just there's a different it's a different way of working on the issue. And as we talked about, you can have an impact on these issues from outside the government as well as inside the government. So, again, I wouldn't I wouldn't be deterred at all. That certainly having a security clearance if you work for the government is seen as a valuable asset, but certainly not disqualifying if you don't have it. So let's take the the government and non-government uh, roles in turn. Which are kind of the best agencies to, to go and, and work for? And and how does kind of the military roles compare to, to, the, to the non-military roles? Do you have any um, idea about which of those is more promising? I think if, if you're interested in nuclear issues or arms control issues, um, you're, you're going to either go to the Department of Energy or the NNSA, which is an agency within the Department of Energy, or you're going to go to the State Department, or you're going to go to Defense Department. Those are really the the main three options. And really, I would recommend people who are, are thinking about this to just go and talk to people, talk to people who are working there and get a sense for what they do day to day. Each of those agencies has its own culture and its own set of issues. If 
If you want to negotiate arms control agreements, you might want to go to the State Department. If you want to set nuclear weapons policy, you might go to the Defense Department. If you want to work on nuclear security and threat reduction, you might want to go to the Department of Energy. So really, it's a matter of just talking to people and getting a feel for uh, what what people are doing and, and matching it to what your interests are. Do you know of any graduate programs or fellowship programs that they have for people who might be coming out of a master's or PhD program for, for, for any of those agencies? Well, so I mentioned already the, the NNSA Graduate Fellowship Program, which again is a valuable program. Uh, I think it's a year year long program to get people into the NNSA and through the, the National Labs Complex and really interesting. I'm not aware of any others like that in those other departments, again, beyond the Presidential Management Fellowship. So earlier, it sounded like I was pretty wrong in thinking that there aren't many NGOs working on this topic. So uh, which, which are some of the best places that you can go to if you if you don't want to work in the government? Well, there's there's a, lots of different types of, of work out there from the academic type work to, you know, more research organizations like the RAND Corporation to consulting firms like Booz Allen to think tanks where you really do sort of academic style work, such as the Brookings Institute, for instance. And you know, there's a long list of, of those types of organizations. You have... Uh, you know, organizations like NTI, where we try to do more action-oriented projects working with governments. You have the Plowshares Fund, Arms Control Association. I mean, I could list dozens of organizations. So I, and I'll, I'll tell my, a little bit about how I found NTI. And when I became interested in nuclear issues, I simply did a Google search for nuclear organizations in Washington. And I found NTI, but there's you know, many, many organizations do the research, do the search, call people. Everyone, people in Washington are more than happy to, to, to talk to young people who are interested in working. There's internship opportunities. It's just a matter of, you know, getting out there and talking to people. So it sounded like one of the, the bottlenecks for this kind of work is getting members of Congress to think that this is a, a priority. Is there any way to do that through kind of, you know, mass advocacy campaigns? I, I've heard about the Future of Life Institute, which is, I think, uh, affiliated with, with MIT, has run a bunch of uh, campaigns on nuclear security issues that have, you know, gone, gone somewhat viral across the internet. Do you think there's, there's, there's untapped opportunities there? So I'm aware of different organizations who take the more grassroots approach. And I think the reality is when it comes to an issue like nuclear weapons or nuclear security, it's really, really hard to do a call to action where people feel that they're making a difference. So it's, it's very easy to tell people about the threat and tell them they should be scared and, and you know, terrify people with the prospects of a nuclear war or nuclear attack. But the key is is enabling people to feel they have some agency over the problem and can make an impact. And I think that's an untapped area that needs to be thought through is how you energize action from the public on these issues. So I, I, I do think that's an untapped area. And I think it's really necessary to find ways to engage the public in a way that they can feel engaged. And I, I think it's really helpful to look at other issues where there's been a groundswell of public engagement and support that have actually led to real changes, government policy changes. And I think that's something that our community can look at more and try to find some lessons that can be drawn in order to do that. I could imagine some listeners uh, thinking, you know, yeah, I'm worried about nuclear security issues and, I, and I'd love to, you know, have a career that helped to solve them. But, you know, going to the State Department, going to Brookings, going to, to the Department of Defense, th- th- this all sounds very intense and potentially, you know, very competitive. Is it risky to kind of set out to, to have a career in this in this area? Might you worry that people would try and then just not be able to get into any of the relevant organizations? Well, I think anybody thinking about their careers will be anxious <laughs> about getting jobs. And I don't think there's a difference really in our area versus other areas. I think people should look at their interests, look at their passions, whatever that may be, and find a place where they can pursue those. Speaking of which, uh, are there any kind of characteristics that you'd particularly look, look for that suggest that someone's a, you know, a really good fit to work on uh, this kind of topic or uh, at NTI or, or a similar organization? I think that, you know, we want people who are enthusiastic about solving these large threats and tackling these difficult issues. One thing about these issues is these are really, really hard, challenging issues. And you may not see a difference, you know, week or month or year or even years after you begin working on it. So you really have to, I think, really believe in in the issue and believe in the importance of working on the issue. So, you know, having the, the passion and drive to keep working at it on a, on a difficult challenge, I think would suit different people more than others. So it sounds like there's there's quite a lot of paths that, that people can take into this uh, and into work 
working on this problem. And I think 80,000 hours has a, has, has a lot more to, to learn. And hopefully I'll have, you know, a bunch more interviews over, over the coming year with people who've t- taken these various different paths. But would you like to kind of say any last final thing to, to encourage people to, to, to venture clear security? Yeah, I think, I think there's just, there's so many pieces to this problem that can be tackled from the nuclear weapons issue to nuclear terrorism to cybersecurity, to regional issues like North Korea and and Russia. And I think become educated about the issue and understand that these are really important threats. And unfortunately, many, many people don't pay attention to them. But this is this is really a vital area. And so I really encourage anybody who is interested in foreign policy, nuclear issues, physics, chemistry, look at this issue and, and, and think about how, how you can make an impact. And we really need young, uh, energetic, enthusiastic people to take on this problem and be the, the future leaders in this area. And we're really looking looking to a younger generation to pick up their interests and, 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 and mantle on this really important issue. So I, I hope everyone listening will you know, take a look at the website, uh, www.nti.org, read about the, the issues, get engaged and think about ways that whether th- they do it as a career or they're engaging with their members of Congress in a- any way possible to really to really focus on this threat. My guest today has been Samantha pitts Thanks for coming on the show, Samantha. Thank you. One last thing before we go. I'm creating an advisory panel to help give me advice on who to interview and what to ask in these shows in order to provide the greatest benefit to people who want to do a lot of good with their career. If you're keen to join that group, uh, drop me an email at rob at 80,000hours.org. I expect it will only take less than half an hour a month, maybe, maybe quite a bit less than that. Kieran Harris helped produce today's show. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week, so long as North Korea doesn't get us first.